Ivan, welcome. Thank you very much in, uh, indeed for uh, coming to talk to us uh, this week. And I thought we'd start by uh, looking ahead to next week and the European Council. There was a time when you would have been in the picture over the Prime Minister's shoulder, walking in past the flags, sitting behind her at that occasion. What do you think next week's European Council will actually be like as they chew over what to offer, if anything, Theresa May? Well, very difficult to judge at this stage as to whether she's got a you know a new proposition uh, to offer, and we'll see whether these uh, bipartisan talks get anywhere. Um, I must say I'd have my doubts as to whether they're destined to get anywhere, and uh, whether there's a viable uh, solution that will emerge from those or will emerge from the Commons. But the other side will want to know by very early on next week whether there's some new proposition and whether something is changing in British politics which gives them something to bite on. And then whether there's any prospect of that commanding a majority and a stable majority in the House of Commons such that uh, something can be implemented and is reasonably likely over the coming weeks to be implemented. You'll have seen the British coverage that suggests no deal is now off the table. You see MPs saying it, certain MPs, uh, and the Commons made it clear yesterday that is what it wills, yes. uh, that, that is what it would like. Um, but what, you think there's still a decent percentage chance that it happens in the next few weeks? Yes, I think there's a decent percentage chance it happens in the next few weeks. And, 20, 30? And then, uh, there, yes, in that, in that sort of range, if not higher, and a decent percentage chance that even if it doesn't happen in the next few weeks, we could be back to this either by the summer or the early autumn, potentially under a different prime minister, when we see, as I say, the direction that prime minister wants to take. Um, so I think there is a serious percentage possibility of a no-deal exit. It's not in the gift of the House of Commons. It's fine for the House of Commons to indicate its clear will, which is there, uh, that there shouldn't be a no-deal uh, Brexit. It's fine to say that we are prepared to legislate to force the government not to trigger a no-deal. That isn't a unilateral UK decision. I mean, we may run out of road because the 27 conclude this process is not going anywhere. And it is not in the UK's gift simply to say, well, because we have a determined desire to avoid no-deal, you must respect it. Now, I'm not naive. I think leaders will take very close cognizance of what the Commons has said, and they are very, will be very reluctant to push uh, uh, a no-deal a no Brexit in circumstances where they think there's a clear majority of the House of Commons against it. Until they see a potential majority for something in the Commons as opposed to against, I think there's deep scepticism about why do you want to keep the European... Why do you want to keep the UK in the European Union at 28, still around the table, still present but, you know, on its way out for an indeterminate period? This blithe assumption both in the Commons and in some parts of the government that the others would automatically want to roll over UK membership for many more months. I'm, I'm, not, sure that, I'm not sure that applies. Let's just look back a little bit about where this went wrong. You've always been clear that when the referendum result happened, I seem to remember you predicted it. I can remember uh, talking to you um, uh, on, on referendum day itself. Uh, but when it happened, this has to be implemented, yes. you said. So where did, it, where did it go wrong? I do think that where you start in a negotiation and how you set out on a negotiation often determines where you end. Uh, the Prime Minister, for you know, understandable domestic political reasons, set out a very hard line and she wanted to demonstrate to her party that she wasn't going to be a counter-revolutionary who subverted, uh, subverted Brexit right at the outset. Uh, from a perspective of a negotiator and somebody uh, dealing with the European Union, she went much further than she needed to at the party conference to elaborate a very firm uh, set of red lines and a firm position. Do you think and she realised what she was doing when she did that? In, in certain areas, for example, on free movement of people and control of borders, yes. On the role of the European Court of Justice on a one or two other elements of the speech, I rather doubt it. So ruling out the single market and the customs union... Well, of course, if you want to end free movement of people and you accept the doctrine of the indivisibility of the four freedoms, and it's very difficult to see why others would uh, not impose that on you. And if you're not prepared to accept the jurisdiction of a supranational court, and that's become uh, a huge issue in the Conservative Party over recent years, more so than in the earlier versions of Euroscepticism, then you have to leave the single have to leave the single market. A single market. I want to be clear, is not remotely like a free trade area. If you're going to take down barriers to trade and above all non-tariff barriers to trade behind borders, 
in a uh, multi-country entity, you have to have supranational legislation, supranational enforcement, supranational adjudication. The, the only way to do that is via a supranational court. If you're not prepared to accept the jurisdiction of that court and start describing it as a foreign court, then by definition you have to take yourselves out of, uh, out of, uh, out of the single market. So I think that was always a given. The customs union question we've been wavering around for the last two and a half years with the Prime Minister, even in the Lancaster House speech, left herself a little bit of wriggle room. Nevertheless, from the perspective of others, she had set up a Ministry for International Trade with clear powers and a clear remit to go for a sovereign, sovereign autonomous UK trade policy. It didn't so make any sense unless you were it didn't absolutely make any committed sense to that. To have done that in July 16, that set a very clear indication to the European side that we were leaving both the single market and the customs union. Did she 100% realise that, um, Theresa May? I th I've, again, I find that difficult to judge uh, in, in terms of the early steps in autumn 16. What was very clear were what I was facing in, in the autumn 16 in Brussels and with key interlocutors in the member states as well as in the institutions were shocked that we were going a lot further out of the European Union uh, than they had expected. This idea that there's only a single version of Brexit, which is the true Brexit, which we're hearing all the time, either her own version of Brexit or uh, the European Research Group version of Brexit, is not the view in Brussels, Berlin, Paris or other capitals. There are multiple different potential destinations in Brexit. They wanted to know which one we might be gravitating towards. They assumed that we would keep options open until we had had some serious dialogue with them uh, at the beginning of the Article 50 process. And they were surprised in autumn 2016 and by the Lancaster House speech at just how red the red lines were and how definitive they were that we were effectively, from their point of view, going further out than Norway, further out than Switzerland, further out even than Turkey, which has a customs union with the European Union. That surprised people. But then, as you say, uh, there are people uh, who would point at what Theresa May has produced and say there's a strong whiff of customs union it's what's antagonising uh, a core of Tory MPs still uh, in her deal. Yes. So did she always want to get to that destination? And she was seeking a large majority in that snap election in order to neutralise the ERG? Or did she go on a journey uh, without telling people much about what she was learning on the way? What do you think happened? Well, I think the realisation that if you take yourself out of the customs, you know, particularly in industrial goods, I mean, the puzzle for me from the outside uh, is that the debate uh, on trade uh, and the debate generally has been dominated far more by the customs union by the single, than by the single market. That's a puzzle to Europeans as well, given that the Brits have been obsessively pursuing single market ambitions from within, including conservative governments for decades. And yet the debate has been dominated by customs union and by tariffs and tariff rate quota questions rather than services. The great uh, uh, surprise to people is the absence of attention of the British political system, the British political class to the services sectors in which we are hugely competitive, in which we have a massive trade surplus with the European Union, whereas we have a massive trade, sur trade deficit in goods. Nevertheless, you know, if you look at this from the outside, it appears that major industrial companies, above all the auto sector, uh, the aviation sector, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, have had more of an impact to, in their lobbying on Number 10 and on the Prime Minister personally than the major services sectors, whether that's financial services and business, legal, tertiary education, audiovisual services. I'm not saying those people haven't done a noble job in trying to pursue their cause, but at the moment, if you look at this from the outside, uh, the government has prioritised and privileged regulatory alignment and ongoing convergence with the European Union model on goods and decided to go more autonomous and sovereign and out of the European domain on services. That, if you're French or German, is a seriously puzzling, rather welcome choice. Why would you not want Britain in a permanent customs union if you're French and, and German? That's very good from the point of view of your industrial concerns. Uh, that's the area in which you have a massive trade surplus with the UK. That's the area where the UK seems to want to be more closely aligned and more harmonised with European rules. To continental European audiences, that's a very puzzling choice. So was there an alternative toolkit? We could have got to somewhere better. She could have satisfied her political base. But you, you didn't have the red lines. I mean, was there, could, could you get to a a destination that was softer uh, if, if you didn't have the red lines. What, 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 what well, would you I, have been telling her if she wanted to listen? 
Well, I think the, the key red line from her point of view, and I do think that's dictated essentially where we've ended up, is the free movement one and the ending of free movement of people. Uh, I think that's been most important to her in the sense that we needed to demonstrate to the public that we had control over the numbers coming in. As you know, the numbers coming in have been rising from outside the European Union far more quickly than those inside the European Union. But that sense that we needed to control numbers and demonstrate that we had national control, that always seemed to me to the, be the Prime Minister's number one priority. There, as I say, under the doctrine of the indivisibility of the four freedoms which underpin the single market, if you want to end free movement of people, and she clearly does, then you have to accept that free movement of goods, services, and capital is in some way constrained. You can't say, well, we'll have three freedoms, but we'll not apply the fourth. That gets us back into some of the terrain that David Cameron had in his renegotiation. Once you've gone there, you have moved a long way towards jettisoning your own best economic interests on the services domain. And that, I think, will come back to haunt us in the next three to five years. If we ever get into the trade negotiation in the next few years, I think we will find in a whole range of services sectors that we are concerned about our lack of market access to easily our biggest market. Bear in mind on the EU, uh, the size of the EU market on services. This is an economy, the British economy exports more services as a proportion of overall trade than any other major developed economy. And bear in mind that the EU market for our services is the size of the next eight markets, including the US, put together. So this is a very major step towards making uh, services exports much more difficult into easily our largest market for those services. Do I think that's sustainable uh, in economic terms in the next three to five years as we sober up in the, to the realities of what the trade negotiation is going to involve? No, which is why I think whatever we have in the political declaration now, under a new prime minister, we are going to have to start rethinking what our position is. But that will open up the migration and free movement and control of borders question, because that will be the corollary that the EU will put on the table. It'll come back. It will come back. Did, did Theresa May get to see um, all the information that people like you wanted her to see, and how evidence-based were the core decisions that launched her Brexit strategy? Well, as far as I know, she did. Um, she did uh, see. She did see uh, advice. You obviously don't know um, when you're outside kind of number 10. I've, I've lived inside number 10 under previous prime ministers and know how that system works. So you never know exactly kind of who gets to see what and when and what goes in the red box and what goes on what goes in the red box. But um, as far as I know, she did. Uh, we had lots of sessions with her uh, as the key senior officials, along with the key political advisors, because she's a new prime minister who had deep and lengthy experience in justice and home affairs as home secretary. And that was the part of the European Union law book that she understood very well and still understands very well. With no disrespect to her, inevitably on the economic side and on single market and customs union and maybe monetary union questions in the broader economic domain, this was necessarily alien to her. She'd never had an economic portfolio in government. So we had to go very fast at the outset in autumn 2016, trying to take her through those kind of issues. I personally do not think that we had got very far in that process before she took the decision on the red lines and announced what she announced at the party conference and then amplified it in the Lancaster House speech of January 2017. So I do think uh, that whilst she had read considerable amounts and digested a considerable amount of evidence from the system, I don't think by that stage we got very far in the process of really working through what our substantive position should be now. Did the strategy come as a bit of a surprise to people who thought they might be at the centre of working on it, officials? Official, well, none of, none of the key officials, the cabinet secretary, uh, you know, Ollie Robbins, the Sherpa, uh, nor I saw the party conference speech, for example. Which the strategy resonated. was announced without a proper discussion. Yeah, I mean, that had no discussion. No, it's a, it's a party leader's speech, not a, it's a political speech. But it defined yeah, the entire strategy. Speech, but it defined the entire strategy, and it resonated hugely in European capitals and above all in Brussels and Strasbourg. So, and that was, bear in mind, that was before she ever attended a European leaders meeting in a European council because she attended that the following week. The week after that, she hadn't met most of the leaders before she'd given the party conference speech which defined the strategy. A lot of people talk about how there's going to be one day an inquiry into all of this. If you were guessing now, what will be the worst headline 
that comes out of it. Well, I don't know whether there will be, and I'm always wary of these kind of inquiries, particularly years after the event, and particularly if they're launched for essentially a sort of partisan reasons. I, I would hope there's a lot of thinking going on inside the UK system, uh, you know, both inside the executive and the legislature as to why we got where we got. I think there are lots of lessons to learn. I don't think we were terribly well prepared for a post-Brexit world. And you can level criticisms there at the previous government for not enabling that to happen and not having proper contingency planning. So had we got a fully developed uh, plan for how, you know, what are the key questions that needed to be worked through on the post-Brexit destination, I, I don't think we can say that. I'd probably give more thought than anybody in the country to the, uh, to the prospect of post-Brexit Britain and given it a lot of thought, both in Brussels and in my previous jobs. But you know, this was not elaborated and written down. There wasn't then a plan from the new administration. We embarked on the Article 50 process without having really clarified the destination, which then set us up, I think, for many of the failures of the Article 50 process. And the fact that the European Union, which does know how to negotiate, it has many sins, the European Union, but it's a formidable negotiating opponent in trade negotiations and has deep experience. It knows how to run processes and without being unkind about it to rig processes in a way that screws the negotiating opponent quite effectively. It does know what it's doing in that. It trapped the Prime Minister quite cleverly really in, uh, at, the, at the outset in this kind of there will be no negotiations until you notify under Article 50. Now, that was inevitably its position because it's after all worried in uh, early autumn 2016 that Brexit might be the beginning of the end, that others might take this course, that there might be a fragmentation amongst the, 20, amongst the 27 of their kind of solidarity. So of course they were going to say that. They, they didn't really expect us to act on the assumption that there would be no discussions prior to the invocation of Article 50. And that was a mistake because you can't go into an Article 50 process like this without knowing really where you want to end up, having absolute clarity. Of course, there was huge confusion, as you'll remember, from ministers at the time and senior ministers at the time saying that not only would we negotiate withdrawal terms by March 2019, but we would have negotiated the full trade and economic treaty and other things by March 2019, and negotiated all the replacement free trade agreements uh, with the rest of the world that we have by dint of EU membership. All of this was fantasy world, pipe dream. Some of us were saying so and saying none of that's going to be negotiated as part of the Article 50 process. The trade and economic negotiation comes next. But we did have to be, before you get to an invocation of Article 50, terribly clear about where we want to end up, what the political dynamics of early 2019 were going to be. Everything that we are now seeing in terms of political dynamics in the House of Commons was entirely predictable at the end of 2016 even before she lost what was a narrow majority yeah. in the first place. The numbers yeah, just weren't there. Um, you touch on the, uh, the EU's uh, ability to run a negotiation. It is what they yes. do. Um, I want to take you through quickly two scenarios. One is that somehow uh, Theresa May does get a deal and we move into future negotiations. I want to come back to the point of no deal, which you obviously think is still a very live possibility. But let's say we do go to phase two. Somehow uh, uh, the withdrawal agreement passes and we move on to the next negotiation. What kind of nick is uh, the British state in to conduct those negotiations as you look at it now? Are we going to be uh, in a rigged game and royally screwed? <laughs> It's very difficult to judge the nick the system is in from the outside, and obviously a huge amount of capability has been built in Whitehall uh, you know, since I exited in the, in the last two and a half years, and departments will be frantically busy preparing uh, you know, their negotiating stance and their negotiating mandate. I'm told quite a lot of people have been taken off that work in order yes, to work on moment, no deal. Yeah, to work on no deal, but I mean, they're gonna to have to be put back on it. And it's a gargantuan exercise to negotiate a trade deal with the EU, because it's not, to be clear, it's not just a trade deal. I regard this as a combination of a trade deal and what I would call in the jargon of Brussels, a deaccession process. So this is like the reverse of an accession process when you're seeking to join the European Union. That covers a, you know, a whole multitude of chapters and is an extraordinarily lengthy and detailed process line by line. This is the reverse of that. It's a disentanglement process. The problem with that, and contrary to what a number of ministers were saying at the outset in 2016, is disentanglement is in some sense more difficult than entanglement because entanglement, and you know, if you're joining the European Union, by definition you know broadly where you're gravitating to and you're having to 
uh, deliver convergence with an already known rule book. We are trying to deliver divergence to an unknown destination where the other side is constantly going to say, well, until we're terribly clear where you want to go, why you want to go there, what level of access you want, what level of autonomy you want, we don't know where this negotiation can terminate. So this idea is the easiest negotiation in history. It's in some ways the most difficult because all trade negotiations that I've ever worked on, but I think all trade negotiations since the Second World War have been between two partners and jurisdictions who are seeking to get closer together and remove barriers between their jurisdictions. This is a process where we're deliberately seeking to diverge because we're uncomfortable with the implications political and juridical of deep integration. We want to get further apart from our negotiating partner. But as you're seeing at the moment, we're struggling to articulate where the hell we want to go. And until we can articulate where the hell we want to go, then we don't know which barriers, how many of them, in which sectors, what degree of divergence we want, what degree of autonomy. So this is actually a very complex negotiation to be gone through. Uh, and the risk that we have, yes, of course, via the withdrawal agreement, the political declaration, the European Union has set up the next negotiation very nicely for itself. You can see all the signs of that. You know, they're very good at this stuff in terms of producing a baseline off which they want to negotiate. The difficulty with that for the UK system is that, once again, we're likely to go through a period of uh, major flux, presumably a Conservative Party leadership election. The Prime Minister already volunteering her head so to guarantee to the right of her party that a different person will take on the next phase. So that means a large degree of political turmoil over the next few months here, whilst the other side calmly gets on and prepares its negotiating strategy for how to maximise its leverage during the next two to three years. And as we've seen in this negotiation, they use the clock and the pressure of the clock very effectively against their negotiating opponent. They know we'll be in a rush when it comes to the trade negotiation because the political imperative will be to get on with it. There's very little pol political imperative on the other side to get on with it. They can twiddle their thumbs and they can let the clock run down and they know that that maximises their leverage to get substance uh, concessions out of the British side. So they'll play that game again. Now the system here, the, the criticism I would have of the current government, if I'm very honest, is they have been outplayed on transparency and openness by the other side. It's very unusual criticism to make that somebody is less transparent than the European Commission. Uh, but one has to say that the Commission has played a blinder in dictating the terms of the debate, being extremely open both with member states and with the media about where it is, where it's going, why it's going there. And it's dominated the last couple of years by constantly setting the pace and then being completely open either in its no deal preparations or in its architecture or in its theory of what can be done and what can't be done. And because the UK has been in such a state of political confusion, it's found it extremely difficult to react. It's been slow and reactive and opaque. And I'm afraid the Prime Minister's personal style, in my view, has added to that because she likes uh, a sort of black box and secretive style of negotiation. But I'm afraid that's worked very much against her own interests. And the secrecy with which she reached the withdrawal ag agreement has also played against her now in this end phase where one has some sympathy with her that she has been through the mill in the last couple of years in a very difficult negotiation. Parliamentarians haven't, including in her own benches. They haven't understood the trade-offs and choices that she's made. And they're now lobbing rocks at her for having made the wrong ones. But they're never really obliged to come up with a proposition which is negotiable in the real world themselves. No deal. Let's say they get the way the people who still dream of that as the nirvana. Um, what will it actually be like? How long will we be just out there with no structure to anything and how long will it be before we're back at the table and what will be on the table? Well, the, this is where the two sides, um, you know, have radically different inter interpretations of what no deal means and how long it would last and then what the behaviour of the other side in response to no deal would be. Um, uh, the assumption here amongst the Brexiteers, one appears to be that no deal is very palatable across large tracts of the economy because somehow, mystically, the WTO provides for you and provides a universal feather bed. I'm afraid, candidly, across large sectors of the UK economy, that is simply untrue. WTO uh, co commitments into the WTO are important in certain specific sectors and, of course, it's above all important in tariffs and tariff rate quotas. But we can't kid ourselves that just reverting to WTO only rules uh, is fine for trade with the European Union. And it's not how we trade with the vast bulk of the rest of the planet either, partly because we have these free trade agreements via, WTO, via EU membership with, uh, 
with many other parts of the world. Partly because even with those countries with whom we don't have a free trade agreement, for example, the United States, there's a whole plethora of other sectoral agreements which ease trade, which go well beyond WTO commitments. So you think we're back at the table sometime not very long well, after the that? Assumption, well, the assumption no on the other side is very much it would be so unpalatable and so bad for the UK economy and so asymmetrical in pain, not least because they would choose to legislate, they are already choosing to legislate at 27. So they will simply dictate the terms of what happens in everything from aviation to road haulage to veterinary to financial services. Every one of these issues, they will decide what elements of continuity they want and are in their interests, as well as sometimes in our interests, and in which areas they want to exert pressure by demonstrating that the state of the world has changed for the worse for the UK. The assumption, therefore, on the European side, which is universal, um, I have to say I hear it from everybody, is the UK would be in such an unpalatable position going to WTO only that it would be back at the negotiating table within weeks from a very weakened position, supplicant and more desperate, because it would have lost so much about the status quo that it, that it urgently needs to replicate. You think just about every leader of an EU country thinks that, if not all the figures in the European Commission? Absolutely everyone I have spoken to in every capital, as well as the people in the institutions, the blithe assumption that it would be intolerably painful for the UK and that we would then find ourselves within weeks with no choice. Now, I think that's naive politically because the political dynamics here in the event of no deal would militate against that. You can imagine the political mood here if the negotiations break down. Think of it from a European perspective. One of the problems with the negotiation and with, I'm afraid, the British political elite's conception of this negotiation is they seem very incapable of putting themselves in the shoes of their negotiating opponent. They have just spent two, two and a half years negotiating an extraordinarily difficult withdrawal agreement plus political declaration with the current British Prime Minister. They've landed the deal both on the backstop, on citizens' rights and on money. The proposition from the Brexiteers is that that would then be foregone. We'd walk away from the table. They would be so desperate to come back that they would offer us substantially better terms across all the same sectors without the money or without any guarantee of getting the same money and without the backstop. You're saying they'll just push the same piece of paper across the table again and say, uh, look, that's where you that. sign. Yeah, they've already had that discussion with Michel Barnier at ambassador level. They're already talking because they're afraid they're frequently ahead of British, uh, British ministers in thinking about the next stage. They're already talking about the circumstances in which talks for a free trade agreement would ever be allowed to resume. They would conclude at 27, in my view, within minutes at the, uh, probably at the General Affairs Council, but if necessary at an emergency European Council, that before we could resume, before we could even open negotiations in, in, tra in the trade and economic sphere, the Brits would have to come back to the table with a backstop proposition, would have to recommit to the same amount of money and would have to recommit on citizens' rights to exactly the obligations they've already agreed. That's inevitable, I think, politically. Just think of it from a French or German or Spanish or Italian or Netherland or, or Nordic perspective. Why would you not do that? Can I ask you um, briefly a virtually impossible question, but where do you think the relationship will be between Britain and the European Union? Let's try 10 years from now. Still talking, still negotiating, still in limbo or... I think we have to be talking and negotiating, and I'm hoping it's in a benign atmosphere where both sides have worked out that it's in their strategic interest to have a close and deep relationship right left. across the board. We've left. Uh, I think both sides are very reconciled to that. It seems to me that the mainstream European uh, leaders and the institutions think that we've left and definitively. The question is then, both in the economic sphere and in foreign policy, defence, intelligence, a plethora of other things on which we need to work together. How close a relationship do you build? Ivan Rogers, you were sometimes accused of uh, people around Theresa May of being a little, little bit Eeyore-ish. I'm not feeling you're that Tigger-ish. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I, I, I begin to wonder whether I was uh, slightly too optimistic in 2016. <laughs> what I was saying then, I stick to really, which is that Brexit is a very complex disentanglement process. I think uh, you said then it would take 10 to... Well, I said it would take uh, until the mid-2020s to settle down and reach an equilibrium state on the other side. I stick by that. We've already expended nearly three years of it. We haven't even really started the internal debate about where we want to go. 
the trade negotiation is vastly more difficult than the negotiation we've been through. A long road still to travel. A long road still to travel with a lots of very difficult compromises to strike across multiple different sectors. And the only sensible thing you can do is have a relatively smooth glide path from the state of integration you're in now, which you don't want to be in, to a much lesser state of integration, which gives you the benefits of autonomy and sovereignty, but does limit your market access into your main domestic market. Ivan Rogers, thank you very much indeed for sharing your thoughts with us.